In my experience, you have really an opportunity to teach developers how to fish. And if you teach them well, what comes back to security is exponentially more than what you put into it. How do we get security part of the feedback cycle of the business? We're in this together. And so you have to be in the thick of it day to day, rolling up your sleeves and working with them. And so that's the first thing about culture. Hi, I'm Guy Pajarni, CEO and co-founder of Sneak. And you're listening to The Secure Developer, a podcast about security for developers, covering security tools and practices you can and should adopt into your development workflow. It is a part of the Secure Developer community. Check out thesecuredeveloper.com for great talks and content about developer security and to ask questions and share your knowledge. The Secure Developer is brought to you by Heavybit, a program dedicated to helping startups take their developer products to market. For more information, visit heavybit.com. Welcome back to the Secure Developer. Happy to have you back with us. And today we have Justin Sumaini. Uh, Justin has a, a very long and extensive history in security, you know, ranging from being the, uh, the chief security officer in uh, a variety of interesting companies, you know, coming from, from Symantec and Yahoo and Box and SAP. I'll, I'll let him sort of tell his, uh, his story in a sec. Uh, but welcome to the show, Justin. Thank you for having me. It's great to be here. So, Justin, before we dig into uh, the many interesting questions that we can debate here, tell us a little bit about, you know, how did you get here, you know, who you are a little bit, some short version of that uh, history. Yeah, so I've been in security for 25 years and started out many, many moons ago at Pricewaterhouse as a penetration tester. And uh, during that process, realized that uh, if I was ever going to be a great consultant, I might actually want to do the job at least once in my life. Got the amazing opportunity to come over to Charles Schwab to run security operations and then realized that this whole fixing security was a lot more difficult than just consulting on it. And so stick with it. And so from there, I went to VeriSign, where I ran all security for five years, went over to Symantec after that as their CISO, then over to Yahoo as their CISO, to Box as a chief trust officer, and then just recently left SAP as our global CSO. And then, of course, you know, as we do in the Valley, we we have a tendency to participate with VCs and security companies. Uh, so I've been doing advisory roles and on, on uh, advisory functions for VCs and security companies as well. So I try to be very active in the industry that I love. Yeah, that's excellent. You know, those things also keep you fresh a little bit, right? I like to say they help you learn in parallel, you know, not just sequentially. So it's quite a journey. Maybe we start a little bit with that sort of uh, historical perspective You've gone from these different companies that were also different in different times. How would you say the security landscape has changed, you know, as you've been tackling maybe the same title across a decade or two? Yeah, I, I think that we have gone through a lot of maturity and a lot more is still yet to come. But over the past 25 years, when I started, security was very much what I would call a very simple audit and compliance. Hey, we have a firewall. You know what? Nobody can ever really execute anything on a web page. Literally, that was a statement <laughs> that was made to me way back in the day. You know, so very sophomoric thoughts about security, even though we had luminaries in uh, security theory back in those days. But as we've matured and grown, I, I think that we've really grappled a, a deeper technical base of what's going on, hence application security and driving it deeper into the nuances of coding and development and how coding is really done in spite of the acceleration that software development has gone through over the past 15 to 20 years. But on par and parcel from a network standpoint and education standpoint, from a organizational standpoint, we've done those as well. Some of the things that I think that is well matured, but maybe a little bit later, if we look at global law enforcement, I remember probably up until maybe 15 years ago, law enforcement was not deeply focused on the cyber problem. It was a bit of a joke in a lot of ways. You know, I hate to say this. Uh, I have a lot of deep love and affinity for law enforcement globally that deals with this problem. But there were other challenges that they were looking at. That's a very different story today. Uh, when you look at the FBI or Interpol or Europol or some of the other uh, agencies around the globe, they have dramatically matured 
Mm -hmm. to kind of deal with the problem as that threat is increased. So we've seen a lot of changes, but quite honestly, I, I think we're maybe in the uh, the first quarter of maturity in application security or in security as a whole. Not unlike, you know, they're still robbing banks yeah. and that's been around for a while. And we look at other industries uh, such as legal or finance that have been around for a very long time. Yeah. And in spite of that, they're still maturing themselves at a slower pace, of course. I, I think we have a long way to go. Yeah, we're still at the beginning. You know, some some changes I think are are obvious in the landscape as you know, as some tech uh, has has changed, you know, like you know, mobile devices or others. But what would you say are kind of the the beacons of change or you know, like what are the the key drivers of difference in, in today's world and security versus, you know, maybe a decade ago? Yeah, when I look at security, I have a tendency at a meta level that you're kind of referring to it. I take a step back and I think about there's a big difference between security theory and applied security. So if we take security theory about how we attach confidentiality, integrity, and availability to data and its transactions, in a mainframe world, that's fairly simple. You apply it in the mainframe. It's a centralized model. You've got green screens that are basically just windows into that data and transactions. So it's fairly easy to implement a CIA model to that. Mm -hmm. But what we saw with a transformation from mainframe to client server, the world dramatically changed. And theory didn't change, but how it was applied did. So where that data was and where the transactions were now shifted to workstations, servers, multiple servers running those services, workstations, data being handled back and forth. So we had a, an explosion of complexity simply because the data and transactions moved and we did not have the mechanisms to apply CIA to it. If we move forward from client server into client cloud, now those services are on the internet with a more insecure, uh, hostile direct access environment, shall we say. But really underneath the hoods, what you're seeing is an interconnection of those services as we look at you know, Web 2.0 and some of these other API integrations that you have. So that transaction and data service model becomes even more complex. Now, as we move even beyond that, what I would call multi-cloud and containerization, while the concept of the service doesn't necessarily change in a great degree in a container model, but what we do have is an exasperation on the operational side that we saw with virtualization. So we have many containers with many data and transactions and how we manage and govern them becomes even more complex and is being done in a multi-cloud space around the globe with a whole bunch of different things. And so how we leverage technology to do things has a significant effect on how we apply CIA to govern those things. And so that's the basic concept of how I look at technical security to start with. And what you see is you're able to predict a lot of the challenges that we face if you keep an eye on what is the new technology that is going to be adopted eventually by businesses and organizations as they try to accelerate their growth and revenue. But containers came onto the market yeah. and now it's flushing and now everybody's trying to run and keep up. We can also do the prediction with serverless, you know, a whole bunch of things that are, yeah. you know, just starting to take hold. Yeah. So, you know, I fully relate to that. You know, I feel there's just like, you know, for starters, there's many, many, many moving parts, you know, and a lot of the sort of the, the safety of controlling the environment has gone away because now everything is kind of, you know, interconnected and mobile and, you know, on the internet. I guess, you know, maybe before we go to sort of the next challenge, I mean, what have you seen as kind of strategies, like successful strategies to help tackle that? You know, like it feels like definitely a big battle. What do people do? Or what have you done maybe that you've seen work to conceptually try and, and kind of adjust to this uh Fragmentation. Yeah, the security management model that I try to approach, I'm a big believer in, in a general statement, the centralization of a security function. So you can get uh, some leverage. But getting to your point, you're never going to be as agile as the lines of businesses or the development teams or the functions in a centralized model. So how do you have a distributed or integrated security model? to be able to deal with the day-to-day -day handling of issues as they come up. 
And as a result of that, generally what you have, and this is more pronounced in application security than it is with security operations, as we have shifted to an agile model, the velocity of change or releases has dramatically shifted, which has forced security to be able to handle this velocity, which is where they struggle to a great degree in AppSec. But one of the models is having embedded individuals in those line of businesses But secondary to that is really finding ways to not only educate and empower the development teams, but also make it clear that because of the models and the decisions that they've taken, there's a significant accountability that they have in the security model as well. And this is where the first problem really comes in with basic security teams and developers is because there are two very different camps, uh, mindsets and, and beliefs. We've grown up in security in this operational model where I create a st- policy and a standard and somebody is just going to build it to that standard. That's what DBAs and system administrators do when they build servers. That is not how development works. Definitely not today. <laughs> you have a problem and the developers are part of the process to engineer a solution. Most security people have never checked in code They don't understand what a CICD pipeline is. If you talk about new technologies or new capabilities like mesh networks or even containers to a great degree, it's just not really part of their normal ecosystem. So the first step in any security build out for AppSec is to really establish leadership or a partnership with the development leads. One, a general understanding and agreed upon problem set security coming to the table with proposed solutions, but not a dictation on what the answer is, but you know a series of answers so that the development leads or development teams can be part of that conversation. But being part of that conversation also means that they're now enrolled, that they're adopting, and that means you're going to have greater efficacy and integration and implementation of those, like static analysis tools and things like that. Yeah, I love the, I guess, kind of going even back to an early start of that answer, you know, talking about embedding security knowledge within development, but it sounds, or it's a security champions even, or the likes, but you're talking about also like, you know, just as equally important is almost the embedding of development knowledge within security and also ensuring that people are abreast on it and having those shared conversations, I guess, when, you know, like in Agile, there is no like, hey, there's like some you know, glorified uh, design meeting that happened that security needs to be a part of. Yeah. I mean, how in practice does that work? Do you sort of take developers and make them a part of the security team? Do you send your security people to sort of to learn how to code? Like, how have you seen that work? There's two, what I would say, parallel paths. One is, how do you get just as much automation of security into that CI CD process uh, as possible? With the developers, you know, of course, because they're the ones that are actually going to have to deal with the output. And so if they're not part of this, it's not going to go well. Yeah. In my experience, you have really an opportunity to teach developers how to fish. And if you teach them well, what comes back to you, security, is exponentially more than what you put into it. Let me explain. If I can teach a developer the basic concepts of security that we look for and how we look for them in general, they're able to shard that into the myriad of different ways that things are actually developed and implemented and coded, et cetera, to be able to come back into that process and actually give advice on better solutions. And so education and training is really big, but it's very difficult to scale. So you have labs, hands-on experience is probably the best one to do. And so you have those mechanisms and it's a train the trainer model. I'm a big believer in that. Train one developer on the security and have them host a lab for 10 or 15. And eventually you kind of go through that process. But on a day-to-day basis, I believe that having an individual that is born from the development community be identified in the security team as the security lead, for lack of a better word, or the security accountable individual for that LOB that effectively is part of those scrum meetings. That's part of that leads. That's doing the, you know, hand-to-hand discussions and walking through and, and working with the developers because I found that developers and the community that they have on a working relationship day-to-day 
is very powerful on being able to get their buy-in, get their proactive approach and get their focus versus a gate check that they have to go through. So I want people embedded as much as possible. And usually identifying those individuals having to be part is the best way to go. Yeah, yeah. What, what I love about that perspective as well is that it's very, it's very analogous or sort of you know, very parallel to how DevOps operate, right? You've got those, you know, sysadmins, ITs that were outside the team. Mm-hmm. You know, today you look at, you know, what happened to those, you know, sysadmins. They became, you know, DevOps automations. They became SREs. They're probably paid to double. Uh, yeah. And, you know, they're embedded into the application while most of the activity, most of the sort of the ops activity is handled by the dev teams, mm-hmm. but the proficiency is built within I guess it depends on the org, but you know, in many times within the org, basically let's apply the same for security and create, you know, security's equivalent of an SRE. Yeah. I mean, it does have some problems though. And so taking a step back and maybe not droning on this too much, but agile has come in, you know, years ago, but has had a lot of changes, not just on how software is developed. That's very easy to kind of kind of see. But the impact on the business, what we call digital transformation on how we digitize the entire supply chain and pull customers in and put suppliers in and actually have those analytics dramatically change the products that are actually being delivered. Netflix is probably a great example of this. On the security side, it's had a significant impact as well that I I think we're just now starting to realize, but can take some insights from newer companies. And so as, you know, waterfall to agile started to approach, we saw a higher velocity. So what does security do? We need to get tools in. We need to do training. But at the output, we still have the same vulnerabilities or the classes of vulnerabilities. Uh, OWASP top 10. I haven't really changed that much, right? So what do we do? Well, we're going to put in an SDK and give it to developers and give them standards. We're going to have third parties come in. And yet what we see is the same classes of vulnerability are still there. Cross-site scripting is still probably the biggest vulnerability, and everybody knows how to solve cross-site scripting. Yeah. The question is, why is it still there? What you have in businesses, you have this problem where developers are kind of caught between a rock and a hard place. They are on one side being paid and accountable for feature functionality of a service, And on the other side, you got security saying you need to be very clean in your code. So you need to dedicate time to both. And it just doesn't work, which is why we have cross-site scripting issues, et cetera, because the workers are going to go where their paycheck goes, right? Feature functionality. So what I see security doing is moving to solve this problem is moving what I would call from a governance and advisory type function to one of governance and product delivery. And the reason for that is, let's take something like cryptography or data at rest encryption. Um, Historically, you have two organizations in a security team, an enterprise security and an application security team. And they would go out saying, you need to have a PKI environment. Here's your standard and build to solve that problem. What we see now to be agile, to be the product security, the security teams are saying, Stop coding data at rest solutions. We will do it and provide you a service, an API service to be able to leverage it. And that means the enterprise and AppSec team are combining into one team to be able to do the PKI, the APIs all the way up the stack to be a production service to the various applications. And that's a very different organizational and skill set model than we've ever seen before. And I think that's a significant change that we're going through right now. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. I guess the you're tapping into some of the advantages. There's a lot of conversations about the advantages of DevOps from a security perspective and the advantages of agility. Probably the most well-touted one or most touted one is speed. You know, it's the fact that you can patch faster. But you're you're sort of highlighting a different one, which is, well, if the system is more library-oriented and microservice-oriented and the likes, then I can interject or the security team can interject more elegantly by being a component of the system that is security conscious. Yeah, when you look at born in the cloud companies, Mm -hmm. security started with one developer solving a problem. And uh, being in the Valley, of course, you you talk to tons of them. And it's like one developer saying, I need to create an identity and authentication mechanism for our service. 
Okay, and then how did it grow? Well, I needed to create a logging API. Then I needed to create a crypto. And then eventually we had customers saying we need to be certified, so we got some of those governance people. Yeah. But it was born a very different model than what other companies that have been around a long time are going in reverse. And so I think there's a lot of lessons in regards to why they have done it and the scalability that they have as a result. And I think it's an incredible opportunity. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. And I guess for that, you need to transform not just how you work, but actually the makeup and the skill set inside of your security teams to be able to mm. to provide these types of solutions. Yeah, I, I would say a security team's staff will rotate about a third, maybe a half from process management that we do today generally into developers. And as a result of that, they're developing internal tools as well to be used but what does that do to the security workforce? Yeah. I think that's a big impact that uh, will be going on for 10, 15 years. Yeah. On the flip side, I guess it, it might be an answer to the infamous security talent shortage, you know, that, that never really does get resolved. Yeah. Not that developers are that plentiful, but, you know, <laughs> a slightly more sort of varied talent pool there. Yeah. You know, we talk a lot about application security, but when we were spoken before, you were mentioning how application security extends more or will extend more maybe you know when you compare it to endpoint security like that's an area that is not as mature as it should be compared to the risk i guess what's your view on the appsec industry if you will yeah i I think the appsec industry is absolutely horrible and the reason why i say that is not that good people haven't tried but it's a very difficult problem to create a business. And so for example, how many firewall vendors, endpoint solutions, et cetera, do we have out there? A lot, Uh, go to RSA, you know, how many of them are dealing with application security versus anything else? And yet when you look at the problems that we face as an industry, 90, 95, 98% perhaps are at the code level. So this makes no sense whatsoever. The only reason why it makes sense is that it's so much easier to create a network control access point than it is to do a mature static analysis kind of model. And it's very, very difficult to do AppSec from a vendor standpoint. Because of that, what you see in organizations is that the solutions that a vendor can put in has no context to the application development service or business in which a company has. So it makes it very, very difficult to create a one size fits all, so to speak, solution when our environments are pretty different, especially for cloud services. Let me put it that way. So what happens is that the internal teams in that company need to take that on since the product delivery statement that I made about security teams. I wouldn't say all of them are yeah. doing that necessarily, but that's what should happen. But this is where why I say application security is pretty bad on one side. We have a complexity and a problem and a difficult business model to create a vendor in this space to solve the problems. And on the other side, uh, we've got developers that are paid for feature functionality and are not able to dedicate or even security teams to get the resources to do all the things that need to be done inside the application to solve the problem. Mm -hmm. The third problem I would say is if we look at any of the other solutions that are out there to do you know, WAF, application firewalls, and things along those lines. While it's an effort, it's what we would call a secondary control versus a primary control. The primary control must be in the application where it has context. It understands what that is versus being outside of it. I think that it's great that we create it initially into the market to get something there as a whole. While we have a long-term solution on driving it inside the application, but generally... Companies haven't done this, so we're only left with a WAF that you know, ultimately causes problems sometimes, right? Yeah, and I guess it's the same kind of notion that you started with talking about how it was easier to protect the mainframe than all these moving parts, you know? Yeah. The application has a lot of moving parts, you know, the network, there's one of it, you know, or there's five. It's just easier to sort of tackle. I mean, nothing for nothing, but how are you able to protect a modern-day application that is containerized, is multi-cloud, Uh, It's got connections up and down your supply chain and developers are pushing releases at least once a day. Yeah, I guess the uh, maybe the good news is that there's an opportunity to try and crack that, you know, in terms of the need of the industry. But the complexity is uh, is very much there. Yes, 
Yeah. Is it safe to add to that that there's a shift in people? I mean, I think, you know, I definitely talk a lot about that, which is, you know, one aspect of it is the complexity. Mm-hmm. But I guess I kind of wonder whether we are talking to the wrong people, right? You know, whether the solutions that are built, you know, I've, I've personally built a product called AppScan Developer Edition that mm-hmm. had a developer in the name, but that was pretty much it. I mean, it was a really good product and it succeeded financially, but yeah. it really was an auditor's product kind of built into a developer environment. Do you see that happening? Do you think that's indeed like an important part of the solution or is that secondary? If, if I understand your question correctly, it's how do we make sure security is acted upon by the various LOBs, in this case, the product team yeah. versus driving security to the networking or ops team, which can't really solve the problem, at least that problem on the application side. I think that that's absolutely the case. But that gets into a very different problem, which is how do you drive a culture of security into the executive management team? Second to that, how do you ensure that security is a business driver so that it is important to the executive management team, which also requires a security person to be business aware? What we generally have is security people, and not to make it overly complex, but you know, we need to be more participatory in the executive management team. And to do that, we need to at least have a modicum of understanding of what a business is, what is a funnel, what is marketing, what are conversion rates, what are sales cycles, and that's generally unknown. What that allows you to do is to use all the tools in your belt customer requirements, demands, competitive analysis of other you know, competitors in the market from feature functionality standpoint, solicitation on deal flows and the sales cycle and how you can shorten that and bring that to the product managers and say, with better security, we can increase net promoter score, we can shorten the sales cycle, we can actually possibly drive top line revenue if we have really lock solid security implemented and have a lean forward approach on how we open the APIs to other partners and networks and all these other things. I believe in that model very, very significantly. It's what I did at Box, actually, uh, as a chief trust officer and, and driving that competitive differentiation on security. And it had a massive impact on the culture and what the developers really see as important because it's coming from the business. I mean, I, I consult with my clients a lot on that one topic. And it is very rarely, I've never heard really anybody really talk about it. And I I feel very passionately about needing to drive that. Yeah, yeah, I agree. And it's hard, I guess, you know, anything that requires an org wide change is not something to be taken lightly. But uh, you also hear a lot about that, even in the worlds of, you know, marketing needing to adapt to agile, it's almost like everything is adapting to this, like DevOps agile change because they're moving yeah. the whole business is becoming one big feedback cycle mm. uh, and security needs to be part of that group as they adapt the business also at a certain cadence that is now you know not just based on feedback and users i guess the one of the key challenges is that security's feedback cycle is kind of bad right like it doesn't hurt until you're breached and then it hurts really bad you know it's uh, it's hard sometimes to sort of know if you're doing it right you know, I really like the way you just put that, that feedback cycle. Uh, honestly, I've never heard that. One, it makes a lot of sense, and it relates, obviously, to a whole bunch of things. Yeah, I, I think if I was going to phrase it a different way, you know, what I was saying a different way, using your words, how do we get security part of the feedback cycle of the business? They are so focused on hearing about what Gartner is saying, what customers are saying, and what the competitors are doing. How do we pull, tease out the security isms of those three and have it be part of life cycle so now they pay attention and drive it inside their orgs? Oh, hallelujah. Now we need to actually get that done. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so actually with that, you know, there's one other bit that I want to make sure that we cover before we do it. And this is actually a decent segue is to talk indeed about corporate cultures and security within those environments. So you've seen, you know, big and small and also kind of over time. You know, what would you say, you know, working with, you know, Symantec, Yahoo Box, you know, SAP, how does the corporate culture play into it? And maybe to try and kind of give it a practical sense, I mean, how did you need to adjust your approach, right? You know, like to change what would work given that surrounding? Yeah, culture is an interesting thing, you know, and there's no one, take any company, there's no one culture. But 
all of them have it. And so I, when you look at security and you approach about implementing it, what you're really talking about is how do, can I move the needle for somebody else? How do I understand what their challenges are, what they're trying to do, and get them on board with the problem that we're trying to solve and know their role into that? Culture is a massively important thing to not only break into that behavior change, but also solidify security as a, a core value of that organization. And so when you look at like a Yahoo being in Sunnyvale and one of the bastions of the internet, you know, back in the day and coming around. And at that particular time going in, it was, you had Facebook, you had Google, especially coming in and a lot of competition that they once dominated. And so there was a bit of a turnaround within the company culture that needed to be aware. I had five CEOs within 12 months, not a fun experience. So to get to the developers, you had to understand the challenges that they were facing when they were going through their own transformation in the business, and how can you help solve some of their problems if you're asking them to help you solve some of theirs? So it's the, we're in this together. How can we move forward? And I think that statement holds true in any other company. In Box, for a great example, you know what? We're starting out. We're a startup. We're breaking through. We're going to go IPO. We've got massive competition from Microsoft and Dropbox and the like. We have limited, massively limited resources and money and all those other wonderful things. We're in this together and we need to fight. You can't have that we're in this together when you're doing a keynote and then walking away issuing a standard. That doesn't happen. And so you have to be in the thick of it day to day, listening, hearing and working and rolling up your sleeves and working with them. And so that's the first thing about culture. The second thing is the development culture versus and the other team's culture is very different. And most security people don't understand that as well, where the developers, they're the creatives of technology, <laughs> for, for lack of a better word. And so they're very accustomed of being presented a problem and they're tasked with figuring out how to solve it versus what we've historically done in security, which is security comes up with a policy and standard, i.e. what the answer is, and we give it to somebody else to just implement that doesn't work very well in development communities. And so what you need to do is you need to go in with not only a clear definition of what the problems are, but probably a couple of options on how to solve it and solicit the input, advice, and guidance of the development community on that ultimate answer. If you don't do that, they're going to reject it. It doesn't work. You don't understand you know, the development process, the codes, the languages, all the other complexities that they deal with. And honestly, at the end of the day, a business is either a product or a sales company. It's not a security company. You don't have the political power. So you got to be in there. You got to win the hearts and minds. And to do that, you got to check your ego at the door because everybody else knows it. You know, everybody else knows you're not as smart as you think you are. And generally, they're smarter than you <laughs> in the development space. Let's <laughs> let's start unpack there. I think we're uh, we might need to do another episode because there's so much more to sort of even uh, even chat there. A lot of great insights here. You know, going from kind of starting comments about security needing to to move from this governance and advisory to governance via product delivery. You know, the the need to build security expertise within Dev, whether it's a security champion, sort of make that a part of the component. Uh, we talked a lot about how you have to sort of figure out the security business value. And from there, like to understand what's the value, how do you turn security into a, a business differentiator and get that into the feedback loop of the business and fundamentally do all of that within the context of the culture, sort of understand what makes the surrounding tick, which I guess it sounds like the end goal is the same, you know, like it's still those same elements of like embedding into the fabric, but maybe the business drivers and the, you know, what's doable and what's not, you know, sort of changes per, per the organization. So not easy tasks, but I think really, really useful perspectives to sort of run forward with. I, I, I really enjoy this. I ramble on for 10 minutes and you succinctly <laughs> and accurately say, yeah, okay, one sentence. This is what you're saying. I'm like, that's fantastic. Yeah. Thank you. Communication matters. <laughs> so before I, uh, I let you go here, I like to ask every guest coming on the show, you know, if you had one tip or, you know, one pet peeve you want to talk about, to try and give to a team that's looking to level up their security caliber, right? To sort of do security better. What would that be? Yeah, I, I love my industry. I love security. I feel that I'm possessive 
is my industry, so to speak. We're all in this together. <laughs> but within that environment, there's a lot of collaboration. We share a lot within the security industry. We're open, we're accepting. And so the one thing that I would say to a developer is just reach out and say, I want to learn. I'd like to be a little bit better. You will be amazed. I and mean, to anybody, myself, anybody on LinkedIn, anybody that you see, you will be amazed at the response of, of welcome and participation that you see to kind of level up education or anything that you might need. Yeah, that's a great tip. You know, like you know, seek out to learn and you know, you shall find. Yeah. So I guess you know that's also, you know, you just teed this up, but I was just gonna ask if somebody had further, you know, comments, feedback, you know, questions for you to ask, you know, on the Twitters or others, how can they find you? Uh, Justin at Samani.net is my email address. I'm on LinkedIn and my website's down, but I'll be building that up again. I don't really do Twitter, but I'm on LinkedIn a bit. <laughs> That's good to know you're on a social network. Justin, this was a pleasure. Uh, thanks for coming on the show. Thank you very much. And thanks to everybody for tuning in. And I hope you join us for the next one. That's all we have time for today. If you'd like to come on as a guest on this show or get involved in this community, find us at thesecuredeveloper.com or on Twitter at thesecuredev. Visit heavybit.com to find additional episodes, full transcriptions, and other great podcasts. See you next time.